Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Jody, your host today, and I'm speaking with Professor Chuan He from the Department of Chemistry. Professor He is the recipient of many awards and accolades. Most recently, the Wolf Prize in Chemistry, awarded by the Wolf Foundation in Israel, believed by many to be a precursor to the Nobel Prize. Professor He is here to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor He. My name is Chuan He. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the uh, University of Chicago. Uh, I'm an RA biologist, but I'm also a chemical biologist. So my lab works on fundamental biology as well as, as the interface between chemistry and biology. Um, so most of our recent work uh, concerns uh, epigenetics, in particular RNA chemical modifications, uh, the fundamental uh, pathways, uh, RNA modifications regulates biological processes, but also potential impacts in biomedicine and agriculture. Wow. Okay. That is so much. I'm so excited for our conversation because I think I'm going to learn a lot from you. Let's start from where you are now. I know you've mentioned a lot of things just in that introduction that I think sound somewhat familiar to us. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the COVID pandemic and the vaccine development, is that that's correct? Does your work somehow overlap with that to some extent? Yeah, I think uh, once uh, the pandemics, the COVID sort of uh, educated the general public is the RNA, right? Now everybody knows the mRNA vaccine. Um, so yeah, being right. a RNA biologist uh, nowadays, RNA is almost like a uh, uh, you know an ID card. Uh, it's easy to talk to uh, everybody because I work on RNA, and obviously, COVID is RNA virus, and the vaccines are mRNA based. And uh, for mRNA vaccines, uh, you know, for that work, they use lots of uh, mod modified nucleotides. Um, so there's lots of connections. Great. I'm curious how you feel your work and sharing your work within and beyond the scientific community might have shifted in the past few years. Um, you were operating where there weren't as many people understanding what you're doing. And now today, uh, many more do. So has that changed the nature of your work at all? It hasn't really changed the way we work because uh, as, uh, you know, researchers, we kind of focus on fundamental discoveries. However, it made it a lot easier to uh, communicate with, with general public. And also, obviously, well, we receive a lot more attention from different parts of the society. Okay, so tell me, tell me a little bit more about what a day is like in your work, in, in going to the lab, going to classes. Uh, I run a you know good sized uh, research uh, group. Um, you know, in, in in many ways, it's almost like running a startup company. Um, mm. You know, we have major support from the university. Obviously, uh, they create a great academic uh, intellectual environment. But we you know uh, we have lots of flexibility, freedom uh, to operate our own program. We go um, you know seek funding from federal agencies, private. Uh, uh, philanthropy foundations, and then uh, we um, we design our own projects. We attract students, postdocs, and you know uh, we mentor them. Um, we run research programs. Uh, after research being done, we publish them. Um, all the work we do, uh, we publish them. We add the new knowledge to the existing information or knowledge base, and from there industry or, or others were, were, were take a look at our, our new discoveries and come up with new sort of uh, medicines or new uh, um, tools that hopefully will benefit the society. Wow, it all sounds so amazing. Let's backtrack a little bit. I'm curious, you know, you mentioned having postdoctoral students in your lab and that that space is a bit of a combination of classroom and research facility. Can you tell us a bit about your own experience working in a lab before you were running your own lab? Right. So, yeah, I was a grad student uh, in Boston, and I also did a postdoc there. So, um, you know, I was a student at MIT. Back then, I was trained as a synthetic chemist. So, yeah, it, it was um, 8.39 to uh, uh, 8 p.m., a uh, 12-hour day. Uh, wow. Six days a week, um, not because we, we are asked, uh, 
or we were asked, but really because we we were very interested and uh, we were inspired. Um, you know, we're very curious about our our, our um, projects. Um, you know, it's basically uh, reading literatures, setting up experiments, um, complete experiments, analyze data, communicate with uh, peers, mentors, and and come up with uh, new discoveries. Um, it was very rewarding, I would say. Uh, was frustrating for the first uh, couple of years because, uh, right, as a um, newcomers, you have to learn so much, absorb so much knowledge, and learn all the expertise. Uh, the key part is really to become an independent thinker. Uh, it took about uh, three years to eventually cross that barrier, and and you can you know one can start to run their own ideas, um, design their own experiments, um, and analyze data, write papers. How long were you in that lab? Three years just to, is, a, is a long learning curve. <laughs> um, it took me five years, but the uh, first uh, eight or nine months was really uh, taking classes, doing, you know, serving as a teaching assistant. That's a standard for graduate school. And you join the lab in the summer. So about um, several months into your graduate school, first year you join the lab, but then you're still taking classes, you know, learning all the knowledge start from summer um that's about nine year nine months into uh, first year started to really work in the lab and now you work for probably four years um and then you graduate with a phd degree i have two questions i'll ask them one at a time so you mentioned these 12 hour days in the lab and you said you would be reading setting up experiments analyzing data can you tell us a little bit about setting up experiments and and how the analysis works in my lab, it was very different from what I used to be uh, as a graduate student. When I was a graduate student, I worked on synthetic chemistry, so there's a lot of intense labor work. Uh, you have to run reactions, screen reactions, and purify your products. It's quite labor intense. Uh, in my lab, we are mostly in molecular biology genomics, so um, it's, I would say, Having good ideas, design smart experiments, uh, very important, and also uh, have uh, good skill sets uh, uh, to deal with a small amount of RNA, uh, which can be easily digested by uh, RNAs or, you know, these are the enzymes that um, everywhere in the environment. Yeah, basically in the lab, you, you uh, clone genes, express proteins, test about chemistry, about chemical activity, and then you put into cells, analyze, uh, you know, you perturb the genes, what are the outcomes, and in that you use all the modern genomic, biochemical, molecular biology technologies. Uh, there are plenty of those. Uh, we also develop new technologies. My lab cover a wide range of different uh, expertise. But again, as I said, very careful, good skill sets, and be able to uh, Understand experiments, design experiments are, are critical. So my other question is about mentorship. You're serving as a mentor now. Um, looking back at your lab experience as a graduate student and now to your work running the lab, what do you think makes a good mentor? And who is a mentor to you and that you learned from on how to be a mentor? That's right. I think, uh, you know, my PhD advisor, Professor Stephen Lippert, he was a professor at MIT in organic chemistry. And I, I learned so much from him. The most important part uh, was not learning how to do experiments. Uh, it was to learn how to be a scientist, how to be an independent thinker, and how to be critical about others' results, but also about your own results. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Steve set up this wonderful environment. Uh, we have 30 um, graduate student postdocs with diverse backgrounds. People come in with different uh, uh, expertise that uh, you can always have somebody uh, to help you whenever you encounter it into a, um, you know, a difficulty in lab. Uh, but also they're uh, well organized. There are different layers of reporting systems. Uh, you have freedom to discuss science with your uh, your advisor at a given moment, and uh, you know exchange ideas with your peers. It's a very open environment, uh, but also very uh, very well managed, and organized. So that was my graduate student uh, 
career and I was trained, I thought I was receiving some of the best trainings. And as a postdoc, I, I did a postdoc with Professor Greg Verdine at Harvard University, which the lab is very diverse, covering at the time biochemistry, structural biology, but also synthetic organic chemistry. So I was able to, in mm. um, two years, uh, absorb so much knowledge. Um, so I, I run a lab, uh, pretty much, uh, I, I would say, a hybrid of these two systems. My lab covers a wide range of scientific uh, subjects, of course, focusing on the biological uh, discoveries, mechanistic uh, investigations. But again, I bring in people with diverse backgrounds, expertise, um, and I, I really uh, work as a facilitator. So I want to make sure students, postdocs become independent. They can, you know, ask my help whenever they need. At the beginning, uh, I will assign general direction or specific project to them. But then uh, in a year, two years, three years, just try to guide them uh, into an independent researcher. Uh, that's the most important part. I love the, I, I love the idea of um, fostering independent thinking and also the idea of your diversity, the diversity in, in the labs. I spoke to another professor, I forget what field he was in, but he also talked about the interdisciplinary nature of, of his lab and how the University of Chicago has been supporting that because there are so many different labs there. Can you think of an example? Have you, have, has, you're talking about the diversity within your lab. Are you also working across the university with other programs or other labs? Yeah, I might be uh, the one faculty that uh, collaborate with most uh, uh, mm -hmm. colleagues here. Yeah, we, you know, we we used to work on zebrafish uh, projects, and we had a lot of help from organisms biology department. And we work on neurobiology, and we benefit so much from our neurobiology colleagues. Uh, now we work on uh, immuno oncology mm -hmm. through collaboration with uh, uh, again uh, physician scientists. Um, and uh, we also have a biomarker discovery program, which we work with, I don't know how many physician, physician scientists in the hospital. Uh, really, it's a, I would say it's a program that connects to many parts of uh, medical school and biological science division. So let's go back again. You know, we're sort of working back, from, back and forth between current times and your past experience. So I'm curious when you think back to your childhood, was there anything that led you on this path of scientific discovery? Yeah, I was born in China when I was young. I was in a strange environment. It was really, um, air, you know, it's a place with a lot of uh, highly educated uh, individuals uh, when I grew up. So, you know, at a very young age, uh, you hear, you know, the major stories are always the greatest uh, physicists uh, of the 20th century. Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, Fermi, Feynman, uh, you know, that was going on for five, 10 years. And pretty much right, uh, I don't know, I think uh, when I was growing up uh, to be a researcher is pretty much uh, being imprinted into my genes. So um, it feels like it's an inevitable path uh, for me. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your education in China was like as a, as a child? And is that where you also went to get your undergraduate studies or did you come straight to the state? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, uh, because of that uh, sort of uh, uh, influence, I would say, uh, because of the environment, I was pretty much sure I wanted to be a researcher. So I went to the uh, University of Science and Technology of China. It's so really a university focused on science and technology. I did a, my undergrad training there, uh, and then I, I, I came to the U.S., yeah, and then I did my Ph.D. work at MIT, a short stay at Harvard, and then the uh, University of Chicago made a mistake. They hired me. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like it, just an illustrious path, rise to the top. Did you, did you go into your undergraduate studies knowing chemistry was the direction you wanted to go in? Or was there a course you took as a general science student that really turned you on to, to the work? It was a long story, but um, uh, just make it short. Uh, as I said, uh, I was always interested in physics, right? Because of course, 20th century is a physics century, right? But I think uh, uh, 
the, the organic chemistry in, in college uh, really changed me. I, I was doing very well and uh, I feel love of organic chemistry. And, you know, that sort of, uh, in many ways, uh, made me um, to be a chemistry major. My college was pretty strong back then, solid state chemistry, which is inorganic chemistry. So I, I became a major in inorganic chemistry. And at graduate school, although uh, I was a major in inorganic chemistry, I was really working on organic synthesis. And uh, at the time, I picked my my PhD advisor because his work bridges chemistry with biology. And at the time, the chemistry student had two or three directions, catalysis, material, biology, and somehow uh, I don't know where uh, the influence came from, but I somehow decided uh, I was going to go with biology. So I picked uh, a chemistry lab that had the biological um, connection or strong biological connection. And then uh, in the postdoc training, uh, I went into uh, biochemistry and chemical biology, and, and that uh, lasted until today. And was there a professor? I don't remember if you said, was there a specific professor in an undergrad who was really influential for you? Um, not particularly, not particularly. I was a pretty, uh, uh, was pretty much making decisions myself all the way. You're one of those self-starter, self-learner, self-motivated, driven, driven, driven. Not sure it's a good thing or bad thing, because uh, mm-hmm. I think it's always good to get advice from people who had experience. So who, thinking to, um, you know, it just seems like you you followed an incredible path, going coming to, coming to MIT, spending time at Harvard, ending up at the University of Chicago. Did you ever, did you ever have doubts? It sounds like it was just like a path paved in gold. I mean, were there any moments where you ever thought, I don't know if I can, if I'm going to be successful at this, any challenges? Yeah, I think uh, that's probably true for most uh, young people getting into science. Uh, I had the exact same experience. You know, we all had a dream, right? Our PhD work or our graduate work is going to change the world. we are lay down the foundation, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. We all were. You know, discover a new drug or uh, or a new catalyst, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My PhD work, uh, you know, obviously I had a lot of ambition uh, came in. After three, four years, uh, as I told you, the first year, uh, you, you know, limited uh, lab activity, but then the la- next four years, very intense lab activities. I did well. I learned so much, but uh, uh, upon graduation, I started to ask myself, uh, whatever I've done, uh, have we learned anything that really shaped the world? Uh, right? The answer is no. Um, you know, we did uh, discoveries, um, but the discoveries are very incremental in many ways. Uh, it may not even matter, which I think 99.5% of uh, uh, graduate students would experience the same thing. Then uh, there's this big gap from expectation to reality. Um, so yeah, I went to talk to my advisor and said it's probably a failed uh, PhD thesis. And my advisor kind of uh, agreed to some extent, but they also encouraged that, you know, you've learned so much. Um, so I went into thesis defense and yeah, my my committee um, uh, was very enthusiastic. They actually gave me a thesis award on my work. Um, so I think before I go going into the thesis committee and, you know, after I written the thesis, uh, during that period of time, I was a bit lost uh, thinking about, should I change uh, my career? Is this the right career for me? I think uh, the acknowledgement from my thesis committee and winning a thesis award sort of uh, uh, add that type of, you know, uh, it really adds tremendous amount of confidence that the uh, uh, at least uh, uh, the faculties that have the best programs in the world uh, think I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I should probably will be able to make it. And, and coupled with the fact that uh, I still think a professor nowadays is the best career, at least the best career option for me. So yeah, and then I, I, I followed the, the standard path. 
That's a that's a great segue into the next question I had for you, actually, which was, did you ever think about working as a scientist in a different capacity than in the university? That's a great question. I've never thought about that, uh, not because uh, I did not like it. It was because I was not given the opportunity, right? Because uh, my career path, my PhD advisor had so many of his trainees went to academia, hundreds of those. Uh, so it's become a natural path. After I set up a lab, majority of my trainees become professor. I personally think, you know, when I was going into job markets, 2000, there's very limited biotech. There are lots of pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, the organic chemists getting hired into big farmers all the time. But for people working on biology or chemical biology, uh, you know, academia is still the, the, the main places you go. Very different these days. There's so many biotechs. In many ways, these biotechs are making discoveries or producing products that change the world, right? Uh, MRA vaccines, uh, CRISPR systems, right? Edited plants, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, today, um, I, you know, if I were young again, um, there is a lot more options. Um, yeah, I would uh, seriously consider possibility to work uh, in a biotech. Is there a dream job? Like, could you imagine yourself working on a very particular project outside of academia right now? Sure, yeah. We've been working on biomedicine, agriculture. I, you know, I love biomedicine. It's so important to save people's life, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, we have some discoveries in plant biology. Well, I think I, I will be professor my lifetime. Um, but just, uh, you know, um, if there's another life, um, I might uh, take some of our plant discoveries and, and um, you know, work on the... Uh, crop uh, industry and improve the yield and uh, really uh, make uh, crops uh, more drought and uh, resistant and you know deal with these climate change challenges. I'm working on that in the lab as well. The best part of the professor life is uh, you know you uh, make uh, basic fundamental discoveries that has lots of implications. And you can take some of the main implications and then try to work it out yourself or through partnership with the industry. Um, I'm wondering if you, you've spoken to this in sort of indirect ways throughout our conversation, but do you have any advice for young scholars who might be thinking about going into work similar to yours or be looking for a research lab to join? Sure. I think uh, there are many advices um, for young scholars, um, before they had a lot of research experience, right? Knowledge scope is limited. So I would uh, strongly urge the young scholars to read, uh, to absorb as much as knowledge as possible and be open-minded is very important. Yes, uh, you're trained in chemistry or you're trained in neuroscience, or you're trained in immunology, but be open-minded and look at other areas and really think about where the frontiers of science is and, and you know uh, how your work could impact science in not five years, but 10, 15 years, potentially. Uh, I, I would say be open-minded. Um, and first of all, though, I, I have to add that you have to love what you do, right? You, uh, you really need to love research, uh, you know, that because you put, you're going to put so much hours, efforts into this and you're going to run into frustrations all the time. Uh, you have to love what you do. Um, be open-minded and, and uh, eventually uh, try to be critical to uh, your own results, uh, your peers' results, uh, publish the papers. They're not right all the time um, and uh, learn to be an independent thinker. <laughs> yeah. All good advice, I think, for especially young scientists, but probably for anybody pursuing anything these days. So I would be remiss not to ask you about this big award that you recently got. Can you tell us a little bit about the Wolf Prize in Chemistry that you were awarded and what that was for? Yeah, it was just uh, a great honor. You know, I really want to thank uh, the, the committee for selecting me. Even uh, I uh, myself didn't expect, um, for sure. So it's one of the top, uh, one of the very top international awards uh, for chemists. I was lucky to share with uh, 
uh, two outstanding uh, chemists. And I, I, for my part, I was uh, awarded for our work of RNA modification. Specifically, we discovered the first RNA demethylases, and uh, that discovery was widely considered uh, to initiate a new field of uh, AP transcriptomic research, uh, which uh, deals with um, study the fundamental pathway mechanism roles of RNA modifications in biology. And we also contributed in many aspects to uh, elucidating the fundamental pathways, how different RNA modifications impact all kinds of um, biological processes. So yeah, it was a tremendous uh, honor and I, I look forward uh, to the, uh, the award ceremony. So when will that be and where will it be held? That will be middle of June and it will be in Israel. Um, so it's going to be a major event. That sounds really exciting. Congratulations again on that. Um... I was reading a little bit about it, and, and they say that that is a uh, potential precursor to receiving the Nobel Prize. So uh, we, we, we wish you congratulations and good luck in, in your future work and hope to hear about many more accolades to come. So thank you for talking with me today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Professor He, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.